Okay, in this video, we're gonna look at three things. We're gonna look at the notion of the order of an integer modulo n. We're gonna see what it means for something to be a primitive root modulo n. And then we're gonna also look at the structure of the group of units modulo n. And so these are all um, really intertwined ideas. So it makes sense to do them all at once. All right, so let's look at this definition first. So we've got an integer a, and it's relatively prime to a natural number n, so in other words, their GCD is one. Then we say the order of a modulo n is the least natural number k, such that a to the k is congruent to one mod n. And now, notice this is equivalent in group theory as a to the k equals one, in the group of units modulo and remember that's the multiplicative group made up of all um, equivalence classes mod n that are relatively prime to n. Okay, great. And we generally write the order sub n of a equals k in this case. And again, in group theory, we have um, <clears throat> A is in uh, the group of units, and we would generally write the order as just these absolute value signs around the A. So we've got the order of A is K as an element of this group. Okay, so the first proposition I want to prove is this one that says the order um, of A with respect to N it divides phi of N. In other words, the Euler totient function. And I'm going to do uh, two versions of this proof side by side. I'm going to do a number theory version, and I'm going to do a group theory version. So let's do the number theory version on the left, and then a group theory version on the right. Okay, good. So for the number theory version, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the division algorithm with the order mod n of a and phi of n. In other words, the Euler totient function evaluated at n. And so what's that? what that's gonna give us is the following. So we can write C of n equals m times the order mod n of a plus some remainder. And then recall that that remainder is strictly between 0 and the order mod n of a. Okay, good. And now the next thing that we can do is recall that we have Euler's theorem that says that a to the phi n um, is congruent to 1 mod um, n. Good. But now we can split this phi n up using this. So we have a to the um, ord n of a to the nth power times a to the rth power is congruent to 1 mod n. So here I just used exponent rules to simplify this left-hand side of the congruence. But now by our assumption, a to the order of a, that's just going to be equal to 1. And so what we found is another number r, where when we take a to the r power, we get 1 mod n. But notice that r is strictly less than the order of a. But remember, the order of A is the smallest natural number that makes this possible, so that means R can't be a natural number. Well, the only possibility now is R equals zero. Because remember, all natural numbers start at one. Okay, great. So we get R equals zero, but now going back up here to this division algorithm, that means that phi of N equals M times the order, but uh, that means that the order is going to divide phi of N. Okay, great. Now, in the group theory setting, we're going to do the following. So we're going to consider the cyclic subgroup um, generated by A of the group of units. So we know that that is, like I said, a subgroup of the group of units. But then by Lagrange's theorem, we know that the order of a subgroup always divides the order of the group. So that means we have the order of this cyclic subgroup has to divide the order of the group of units. But again, we know that the order of a cyclic subgroup is equal to the order of its generator, but we know the order of its generator is exactly um, the order of A with respect to N. And then we know the order of the group of the units 
is phi of n. Okay, good. So two nice proofs to prove this proposition. I'll clean up the board and then we'll look at the notion of a primitive root. Okay, so now that we've talked about the notion of the order of an integer modulo n, we've shown that that order must divide phi of n, so that actually gives us an upper bound for that order. If something has to divide phi of n, its largest possible value is phi of n. And in fact, if an integer achieves that largest possible value, that's a really important case, and in that case we say it's a primitive root. So let's look at this definition. So again, if the GCD of r and n equals 1, so they're relatively prime, we say that r is a primitive root modulo n if the order of r mod n is phi to the n. In other words, this r achieves its largest possible order. Okay, and then there's this fact which I have like almost half a dozen videos that lead up to the proof of this fact, so I'm not going to do this here because we're mostly going to focus on the group theory implications of this. But there is a primitive root modulo n if and only if n is in the following list. So n is 1, 2, 4, p to the k, or 2 times p to the k, where p is some odd prime. So those are the only cases when there's a primitive root. And again, it takes quite a bit to do that proof. I'll let you guys check that out on the channel if you want to. Okay, so now here's a really important proposition that we get uh, related to the group theory implications of this. So un is cyclic, so the group of units is cyclic if and only if there is a primitive root mod n. And in this case, we have un is actually isomorphic to the cyclic group z sub phi n. Okay, so let's look at the proof of this. Okay, so this isomorphism is pretty easy to prove. So now let's first let R um, in UN be a primitive root. Mod N. So remember, our primitive root, we're saying it just comes from the integers, but we can always take the equivalence class of that integer modulo n, and that will put it inside u of n. And now the next thing that we want to do is notice that um, the cyclic subgroup generated by R is going to be, well, first of all, it's going to be isomorphic to z um, Cn, because we know all cyclic groups um, are isomorphic. If they have the same order, we know that the order of this is phi n, so that makes it isomorphic to this cyclic group. But then we also know it is a cyclic subgroup of un. Okay, good. So look, let's see what we found here. We have found a subgroup of UN that has the same number of elements of UN and that's isomorphic to this cyclic group. So it follows immediately that Z sub phi N is isomorphic to UN. Okay, so let's reiterate. We took a cyclic subgroup. We knew the cyclic subgroup was isomorphic to Z of phi N. Then we also knew that this cyclic subgroup had the same number of elements as un, which makes it equal to un, which tells us that we have this isomorphism between these two groups. Okay, great. So now I want to clean up the board and then we're going to focus more on the structure of this group of units. So now we're going to look at two important propositions which are going to bring us to the structure of the group of units. The first one says that if the GCD of M and N is 1, then UM cross UN is isomorphic to UMN. And then the second one says that if M is bigger than or equal to 3, then U of 2 to the m is isomorphic to z uh, mod 2 to the m minus 2 cross z mod 2. So in other words, this product of cyclic groups, direct product of cyclic groups. Okay, and in fact, if we have these two pieces, then we can take any integer n, factor it into primes, and then decompose its group of units into uh, direct product of cyclic groups. Okay, so now we want to look at this first proposition first. We'll look at this proof. And uh, we want to do it in the following way. So uh, let's uh, suppose that x, y 
is in U-M cross U-N. So in other words, we have a group U-M cross U-N. Multiplication component-wise is the operation where the multiplication in the first one is happening mod M and in the second one is happening mod N. So that's what's going on there. And now uh, the next thing that we want to do is let's set A equal to um, N inverse in um and b equal to m inverse in un and so we know that this is possible because the gcd of m and n is one okay so now with this setup we can define our um, isomorphism so we'll take phi uh, of x y to be equal to uh, the following so x times m times b plus y times n times a. Okay, great. So now the first thing that I want to check is that this is indeed a homomorphism. And let's see how that goes. So let's do phi of, so we need x1, y1 times x2, y2. So there we have the multiplication happening inside the function phi. But now notice that's just phi of x1, x2, y1, y2, because we have component-wise multiplication there. But now this is going to be by our definition up here, x1, x2, m, b, plus uh, y1, y2, n, a. Okay, cool. But now what I want to do is add zero to this, and I can add zero by adding any multiple of m times n, because here I'm working um, in u, m, n. Notice that phi is going from u, m cross u, n up to u, m, n. So in my codomain, I'm in u, m, n. Everything here is happening there. Okay, great. So here's what I'll do. I'll add um, x1, y2, m, n, a, b. And then I'm also going to add x2, y1, m, n, a, b. And now both of those are equal to zero in u, m, n. But what that allows us to do is factor it exactly the way that we want to. So we can factor this like x1, m, b, plus y1, n, a, times uh, x2, m, b, plus y2, n, a. But that's exactly equal to phi of x1, y1, times phi of x2, y2, making this thing a homomorphism. Okay, good. I'll clean up the board and then we'll prove that it is one-to-one -one and ought to. Okay, so we've proved that this map is a homomorphism. Next thing that we'll do is prove that, is, that it is injective. So uh, let's see how we can do that. So let's suppose we have something that is in the kernel. In other words, we have phi of x, y equals one. Remember, that's the same thing as saying that x, y is in the kernel of phi. And now if we can show that that means that x and y are both one, then uh, we started with something in the kernel which makes this thing injective. Great. So what that tells us is that x, m, b plus y, n, a is congruent to one mod m, n. And recall, that's one in u, m, n. So from here what we can do is notice that that means that x, m, b plus y, n, a equals one plus some number k times m, n. Okay, good. But now we'll reduce this mod m and we will reduce this mod n and see what we get. So if we reduce this thing mod m, notice that this first term goes to zero. This last term goes to zero. So here I'll underline this in yellow. So this thing is going to go to zero. This thing is going to go to zero because those are both multiples of m. And then a times n is going to be 1 because a and n are inverses of each other in u, m. And we're just left with y is congruent to 1 mod m.
Okay, good. And then if we reduce this thing mod n, the same kind of thing is going to happen. So notice in that case, this second term is going to become zero. This term over here is going to become zero. And then we know m times b is equal to one because we're that because of those inverses in u n. So what we will get is x is congruent to one mod n which tells us that x comma y equals 1 comma 1, um, which is exactly what we need in order to show that this thing is injective. We showed that the kernel is trivial. Okay, now the next thing that we'll notice is that the size of u m n equals uh, phi m uh, n, which equals phi m times phi n because of the multiplicative property of the Euler Totian function. So I've got a video on that if you're psyched. Um, but that's equal to the size of u m times u n. So we get injectivity directly, and then we get surjectivity indirectly, given the fact that these two are both finite sets of the same size. Okay, so let's reiterate, we constructed a homomorphism, we checked that it was a homomorphism, we showed directly that it was injective, and then we argued that since these sets are the same size, it's surjective, which makes this thing an isomorphism. So we have UM cross UN is isomorphic to UMN when M and N are relatively prime. Okay, so next we'll move on to this proposition. Okay, so next we want to move on to this proposition. So we have the group of units uh, modulo 2 to the M is isomorphic to this direct product of cyclic groups. So we have Z sub 2 to the M minus 2 cross Z, Z2. Okay, good. So in order to prove that, we need this following claim about the order of 5 mod 2m. And it turns out that the order of 5 mod 2m is 2 to the m minus 2. So in fact, that's going to generate this cyclic group that's going to make this part right here. Okay, so the base case of this claim is easy. So let's look at this by induction. So let's suppose that the order mod 2k of 5 is equal to 2 to the k minus 2. And we're also going to um, have like a two-step induction hypothesis. So we'll also suppose that the order um, mod 2k minus 1 of 5 is equal to 2 to the k minus 3. Okay, so what this tells us is that 5 to the 2 to the k minus 2 is congruent to 1 mod 2 to the k. So that's one fact that we get from there. But since the order is equal to 2 to the k minus 2, it means if we raise 5 to any number smaller than that, we will not get 1. So in other words, 5 to the 2 to the k minus 3 is not congruent to 1 mod 2 to the k. Good. But this is congruent to 1 mod 2 to the k minus 1. So in other words, 2 to the k minus 3 is congruent to 1 mod 2 to the k minus 1. Okay, so let's reiterate where we get those. So this fact is going to tell us that when we raise 5 to this power, we get 1. But when we raise 5 to a smaller power, we will not get 1. That would contradict the order of 5. Um, but then this fact tells us when we raise 5 to the 2 to the k minus 3, we will get 1 if we work modulo half of what we had before. Okay, so now putting uh, these two together, that tells us that we can write 5 to the 2 to the k minus 3 as 1 plus 2 to the k minus 1, and that's going to be mod 2k. Okay, great. So we know that it's 1 mod 2k minus 1, so that means uh, when we're working mod 2k, we can add a multiple of 2k minus 1, and then we'll get that. So notice, really, we have a coefficient of 0 or 1 here. We know that it's not a coefficient of 0 because this is not congruent to 1 mod 2k, and that's what we would have if it were a coefficient of 0. So we know that it has to be a coefficient of 1. We know it's not a coefficient larger than 1 because we, because we can always reduce that. 
Okay, great. So now the next thing that we'll do is scale this up one. And so this is, this implies that five to the two K minus three is equal to one plus two to the K minus one plus B times two to the K. And now this is all working mod two to the K plus one. So for the same reason, but in this case, B is allowed to be zero or one. Okay, great. So now what we'll do is square both sides of this equation. So let's see what we get when we square both sides. And I should say congruence, not equation. So I'll skip all of the like arithmetic details, but what we get when we square both sides of this is we get five to the two to the K minus two is equal to, well congruent to one plus two to the K mod two to the K plus one. Great. So in other words, five to the two to the K minus two is not congruent to one mod two to the K plus one. Okay, so I'll clean up the board and then we'll see why that finishes off this claim. Okay, so let's see where we were. So we know that the order of five has to divide phi of two to the K plus one, so we proved that earlier, but phi to the 2k plus 1 is equal to 2 to the k, so you can check that um, using a formula for uh, Euler's totian function. And then we also know that 5 to the 2k minus 2 is not congruent to 1 mod 2 to the k plus 1, so that leaves us only two possibilities. So the order 2k plus 1 of 5 is either equal to 2 to the k minus 1 or 2 to the k. So it can't be that, and then it has to divide this number, which only leaves those two powers of two left. Okay, good. And then another thing we know is that the group of units is not cyclic because we know powers of two don't have primitive roots, so that takes this away. So let's see, otherwise, U uh, 2K plus 1 would be cyclic, which means there would be a primitive root mod 2K plus 1, but by our fact that we wrote down earlier, we know that that's not true. So what that tells us is that the order uh, mod 2K plus 1 of 5 is equal to 2 to the K minus 1, which proves our claim by induction. Okay, good. I'll clean up the board and then we're essentially done. Okay, so now we have the following. We have the order mod 2m of 5 is 2m minus 2, and then we also know from previous stuff that the order of the group of units mod 2m is equal to 2 to the m minus 1 because that's the Euler totient function evaluated at 2m. Okay, good. So now we know that uh, this cyclic group, z to the 2m minus 2, is isomorphic to the cyclic subgroup generated by 5 of this group of units. So again, u2 to the m, good. So let's go ahead and call this thing h. Great. Okay, so now let's consider these other two cyclic subgroups. So let's consider the cyclic subgroup generated by 5 to the 2 to the m minus 3. So notice that is a cyclic subgroup of 5, and it's also isomorphic to Z2. And we can consider another one, which is minus 5 to the 2m minus 3. So notice that's also going to be uh, isomorphic to z2, but that is not inside the cyclic subgroup generated by 5. So here we'll say this is not a subgroup of the cyclic subgroup generated by 5. And we know that because cyclic groups only have one subgroup of a given order. And that's easy to check. Okay, so we'll take this cyclic subgroup uh, generated by minus 5 to the 2m minus 3 and we'll call this thing k. And now it's easy to check that in fact, um, this group of units, uh, 
U2M is actually the internal direct product of HK. Great. But since H and K don't overlap except for at the identity, and that's another easy thing to check, we see that this is isomorphic to H cross K. And then let's go ahead and say that's because H intersect K is just the identity. But then H is this 2 to the M minus 2, and K is this cyclic subgroup of order 2, Z2, which allows us to decompose this group of units in the way that the proposition says. Okay, so good. Now that we've done that, I want to give uh, an application. Okay, so now we've got a corollary that follows immediately from these two propositions that we just proved, and that is if P I are distinct odd primes, then we have U, the group of units of this number right here, which we factored into primes, 2 to the M, and then all of these odd primes. So that's going to be uh, isomorphic to Z2 cross Z2 to the M minus 1 cross Z sub P1 N1 minus P1 N minus 1. So that's phi of P1 to the N1 all the way up to uh, Z mod all of that PK stuff. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at an example of this. So let's maybe look at U of 600. So we've got 600 is 2 cubed times 3 times 5 squared, and that means that U600 is going to be isomorphic to Z2 cross Z2. So notice we get uh, 2 to the 3 minus 2 um, cross, uh, let's see, that's going to be Z2 uh, again for the 3 part, and then cross Z2. 25 minus 5, so that would be Z20. Okay, good. Let's look at one more example. Let's maybe look at U50. Great. But uh, now notice that this is going to be uh, derived by factoring 50. So notice 50 is 2 times um, 5 squared, right? Good, um, and then we can use that this is the fact, so U50 is equal to uh, U2 cross U25. So we're using a slightly different strategy given the fact that our powers of two aren't quite as nice. Notice U of 2, 1 is just the trivial group Z1, so there's nothing going on there. So we just get U25, uh, but uh, by this up here, we know that U25 is Z20. So we get that. Okay, good. So this is a good place to end.